You can have the most successful resuscitation, great outcome, thorough economy, patient went to the OR, survived, got discharged. But if that encounter with the nursing staff, with the respiratory therapist, the pharmacist in the room, they remember how brutal that was, I've lost that game. Welcome to the Emergency Mind Podcast. I'm Dan Dworkis, and this is a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. Our guest this episode is Dr. L.A. Alvarez. Dr. Alvarez is a board-certified emergency physician and an assistant residency program director at Stanford. The main thrust of his work is how developing compassion is important not only for individual wellness, but also for exceptional performance. He's also worked on the importance of diversity and inclusion at both the local and national levels, and spent time with multidisciplinary organizations like Arena Labs and the Mission Critical Team Institute, studying what makes high-performing teams function the way that they do. In our conversation this episode, we dive deeply into what it means to truly define success both for yourself and for your teams in high-pressure situations. We also talk about the importance of self-compassion on getting through critical cases and on how to really functionally debrief after a situation, not just about the techniques or what happened, but also about the mental models and frameworks that individuals were using. Before we dive into what was truly a fun episode to record, a reminder if you're not already to sign up for the Emergency Mind newsletter. It's called Knowledge Under Pressure, it's free, and it's awesome. It does a really deep dive into a lot of the concepts we cover in each episode. It also includes links to other articles and things that people from the Emergency Mind community are studying currently as they themselves work towards applying knowledge better under pressure. Again, it's free, it's awesome, and you can sign up at emergencymind.com slash sign up. All right, all that said, let's get to the episode. I hope you enjoy. LA, I am so happy to be here talking with you. We've been we've been ironing out the details of getting together to talk about this and have been really looking forward to it. So welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you. I, I, likewise, as well here, our first introduction call was uh, pretty fun and powerful. Uh, I'm still finishing up uh, the book Peak. Yeah, absolutely. And I, we're going to definitely circle back to that book because I've got some stuff to dig into from there, too. Um, I was hoping we could start uh, actually with something that we talked about a little bit on the phone the other day, a, a concept that I guess, geez, no pun intended, really stuck with me was this idea of residue that you were talking about. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. What, what is that? What is residue? And, 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 and how did you get involved in sort of thinking about that piece of it? Yeah, so the concept of residue came from this group that uh, I'm part of. It's the Mission Critical Institute Teams or Mission Critical Teams Institute. Uh, And it's a group of uh, high performance teams, including the military, um, also sports teams, uh, Google, and several other big organizations. And the whole focus is learning about um, how to uh, develop people from either from the very beginning from selection recruitments all the way to growth and also by the time that uh, you retire them uh, the concept of residue is this idea from uh, actually from actors in uh, in hollywood that's when they take on a role of somebody um, this persona that they carry on um, leaves this residue in them such that when they leave the character they kind of have to learn ways of dealing with parts of those characters because it carries with them and similar to um, our field in medicine whenever we take care of patients uh, we've heard of burnouts um, and and that's fairly common Uh, but i think this one for me resonates a lot more because every encounter that we have uh, especially those ones that are memorable the the bad ones the ones that are impactful it leaves a residue in us Um, some people call it vicarious trauma some people call it second victim syndrome some people will call it secondary trauma, uh, but somehow, even if it's not a, a traumatic event, the the highlights of our work it leads something with us. Um, and cumulatively, if we don't know how to deal with that, I think it affects the way that we uh, treat people in the future, how we interact with each other, um, and also how we take care of ourselves. Hmm. I think there's there's certainly um, 
while that's important all the time, I think that's certainly really important for us these days in the middle of a pandemic like this, where we're trying to balance not only taking care of our patients, but figuring out how to go home to our families, to our friends, and and sometimes feel very radioactive, like we're potentially bringing some terrible thing home with us. Um, you first came across the concept of residue as like a name through this work with the Mission Critical Team Institute. But but personally, in your own career, is this something that you've been sort of thinking about before this as well? Yeah, so I've been very interested in the concept of burnouts uh, from a lens of, so my initial uh, path in, uh, in emergency medicine was I wanted to uh, be a, a medical director. I wanted to run systems and uh, specifically county hospitals. And in my role as the assistant medical director on clinical operations and quality, I realized that I was driving um, some people uh, to burnout. Uh, in, in full honesty, I was the one that would write them emails about, you could do better with this. Um, uh, we need a better system, faster, more efficient, cheaper. And, and I saw how much impact that led to, despite my goal of making the system better, um, the end user was not seeing it that way. It was more of, I wanted them to work harder, more hours, uh, or uh, just do more in the short uh, amount of time. Um, I explored that more as soon as I uh, really transitioned into medical education because I saw how much of that effect uh, is exponentially uh, manifested with our residents. Um, and the more I've learned, uh, looked into this, the more I'm realizing that really medical students, residents, trainees uh, are experiencing a lot more of this because of the limited amount of information that they have from a clinical sense. And so for them, I think it's a lot more overwhelming uh, to take on feedback, for instance, whereas as faculty, we can um, push things aside or, or away when, when we think that, well, I, I, I see your points, but that's not how I'm gonna practice. We, we have our own um, practice style already. So um, I think uh, in a concept of residue, what I'm realizing is that each of us have had these traumatic events um, throughout our training and also the way that we treat ourselves. And, and it took me a while to really recognize the importance, for instance, of self-compassion and how to manage these residues and, and live with it. Uh, there's a nice book, The Body Keeps the Score. And it also highlights how even though we try to rationalize things um, uh, as they are happening to us, um, it's really hard to control the emotional aspect of it, uh, because that that tends to linger. That radioactive uh, notion that you mentioned um, it stays with us, and and also we tend to ruminate a lot more. We think more of of our failures because we drive ourselves to perfection. I mean, that's what got us here, right? Like to to get into medical school, we had to get all A's, including organic chemistry and all those classes that probably is not as helpful right now anymore. And yet we all had to go through that tiny. Um, lens of scrutiny. Um, and then beyond that, uh, by the time that we got to medical school, then all of a sudden we're surrounded by super achievers and we had to get into residency. And constantly we're telling ourselves, you have to be better, you have to be top of your class. And and then we're realizing that we can't, but somehow that disconnects, um, we're, we're, we're just pummeling through our work. Um, I think that's why um, we take medical harm a lot more seriously, uh, not just because, yes, it harms patient, but also it's it's more of a personal accomplishment or failure on our part when when things don't go as well as what we would want it to, to happen. Yeah, there's, there's so much in that, man. And I, I think that implicit in all of that is this idea that, you know, we're not designed to do one case. We don't exist. We don't get trained to do one particular case. We're in this for the long haul. We're in this for the integral of our work over time. And it's really the ability of our of our continued application of knowledge over the years that is going to make the difference for, for humanity and for the communities that we live in and serve. And if that's our goal, if our goal is longevity and integral of work over time, then we have to prepare ourselves to be able to do that. And that requires thinking really seriously about how to not just protect ourselves, but actually how to design ourselves to be 
I guess anti-fragile would be the right word in there, right? To, to continue to grow under the stresses of what we're doing. Um, on a moment to moment basis, that probably involves a lot of details about balancing the tension level of training that we put ourselves under, right? Not just as a, not just as a medical student, but you and I as attendings, we are still training ourselves, hopefully, hopefully we're doing that, right? And we need to balance that tension of not too tight, not too loose and figuring out how to do that. Um, certainly we are at a better place, you and I, to design our own tension because we're more the, the masters of our own universe, so to speak, at the moment. Um, and that's a lot harder for people that are, that are earlier on in their training who are more at, at the whims of their, of their uh, trainers. So, so let's, let's dig into that idea a little bit. So, and I guess let's bring it back a bit to residue. So let's say, let's say you're a medical student, you're an early career resident, you're somewhere in there, and you have a case that's super difficult, you're involved in your first code, or you, you come across a situation where you need to be performing at this incredibly high level, and something happens, and it doesn't break the way that people really want it to break, there's a bad outcome of one sort or another. What do you do with that? What do you do when you recognize that, that thing in yourself, that residue, and, and even how do you recognize that? Yeah, um, and and I think that's the problem with residue. You don't really realize it until it accumulates um, a whole lot more. You and I have clear cases throughout our training uh, that we remember distinctly. Our very first death, our very first resuscitation that did not go well, our very first bad outcome that we got that letter from our peer review team that said uh, we screwed up. Those are very um, clear cases in our minds. Um, to the point for me, I can even tell you which room it is, who I worked with, um, and what I've done, the communication that I had with patients. That's uh, that's a lot uh, for us to carry, right? And I think that the question that's, that you ask is, is very valid. How do you deal with that? And for me, it's, it's a lot easier now, knowing what I know, um, and having gone through this for um, uh, for several years, uh, I'm out of residency uh, for for a decade. So so for me, that's been very very helpful. However, when I'm learning, so as a medical student, for instance, it's hard to own up to mistakes when you know there's also grades. Um, I've alluded to that already. It's a different perspective when you're a resident. When um, when we make mistakes as a resident. Uh, the feedback that we're getting is actually supposed to help us get better. All of this is supposed to be formative. And yet all our lives, especially the, the generation now that's just starting residency, um, they have been exposed to evaluations left and right. And we do it everywhere. You like a tweet, um, you like Facebook, everything is surrounded by um, a scoring system. And so if all your life you've been, you've been focusing on being graded and grading other people, um, when you have a bad outcome, you automatically start grading yourself. And that, I think, is very hard to unlearn. Um, and it's something that me as an assistant program director uh, is, is something that I find really, really fascinating for, from a trainee perspective. Because we all make mistakes. I still make mistakes. You still make, make mistakes. But for a resident, for an intern, day one intern who, who helps you with that resuscitation and that patient dies. Like I remember um, this case in the ICU when I, when I put in a central line and I stuck myself um, with, with a needle, mm -hmm. right? On a patient who has AIDS. And I still remember the room, how I felt, how I blamed myself that eventually that patient died and, and I was not good enough. Like all of these things that I carried me. The one thing that would have helped me at that time was if a faculty member came up to me and said, this is a lot to take on. I screwed up myself. This is what happened to me. Um, often, I think because of shame, um, we really struggle to own up to that. Uh, we, we don't like to be vulnerable in front of our trainees. Um, and also, there's some truth to why that we're, there's also some, some real ramifications sometimes when you're over vulnerable and you're, you have not developed that uh, rapport with your, with your junior learners, right? Because they might think that you don't know what you're doing. When in fact, people that I really truly respect a lot are the ones who are great uh, clinically, uh, master clinicians. They can do procedures like with their eyes closed. And yet one of the first things that they usually talk to me about is when they've made a mistake. The ones that are very comfortable with their mistakes, because those are the ones that you know uh, are, are looking through in their minds as well. How can they do better? So that's the um, 
That's a very important aspect of, of this learning process. But from a residue perspective, I think we need to be able to acknowledge that these are things that we cannot prevent. We will get residue. It's just a matter of how do we take care of ourselves as we're dealing with all of these residue. And eventually, um, hopefully, if you're if you've developed enough insights uh, from from that perspective, then hopefully you can also design systems that will protect your learners from from continuously like berating themselves when they go home. I've learned that, and I'm still learning, right? Like um, I'm learning that uh, sometimes when I give feedback, uh, it lands very harshly on on some learners. Despite all, like I know all of this, and and I know that how how minimizing that and like efforts to minimize that is very very important, but it's, you mentioned the word anti-fragility. It's very hard because I don't know what kind of experiences each learner has had up to this point. Some people are going to be able to withstand a certain type of feedback. And some people, they they will not, cannot um, take any feedback, especially um, in the heat of the moment. So on that shift, maybe they're just too fried. And, and I've learned that as well. Um, I've given somebody feedback at the end of the shift because I thought that's like a time to summarize because the challenge in emergency medicine is we don't really, we don't really, um, we cannot predict when we're going to work next. And so there's a sense, especially for faculty to kind of like dump as much information to the, to the learner. So, so then you can close that loop in your mind. Um, what I'm learning is that some days it's just not the right time to give feedback and and maybe the experience itself is feedback and and what is more important is that support just like when i screwed up and 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 i stuck myself um if i had a faculty that said you know what this happened to me this is why I, what, what i went through uh and this is how um how tough it's going to be uh from an emotional from a mental perspective when you go home um i think that would have helped me a lot as opposed to that shame like I can't believe I did that. I, they must think that I'm not good enough here uh, to be in this residency program. So just putting this slightly in context, right? So a thing that we talk a lot about on on the Emergency Mind podcast is the idea that being able to apply knowledge under pressure and perform in the highest stress situations requires dedicated training under pressure. It requires you to train under pressure, usually in a graduated sense, like you add more and more pressure throughout your training until you get better and better at your skills, and then you're able to really perform more where it counts. And I think what we're talking about here fits into that in the sense that it's really difficult sometimes to understand how much pressure you should be putting on yourselves at different times and how to balance that pressure in an optimal way, right? It, it's like, um, you know, it's like a, a guitar string, right? If you don't have enough tension on it, you don't get music. If you have too much tension, you break the string, right? Yeah. right? So if we're not giving ourselves and our learners enough stress and tension, we're not doing them any favors. They're not going to be able to develop into the, the type of hardened and flexible practitioners it takes to really respond to emergencies. Conversely, if we overburden people or overburden them in the wrong way, then because it's not just the amount you carry, it's how you carry it and how you carry it at that moment and how much you can carry at that individual second of what you're doing. Yeah. And understanding that dynamic balance of, of balancing what is essentially your strain and your recovery ratio, like that's not an easy thing to do for another person. I also think it's not an easy thing to do for yourself and figuring out how much strain you should be taking on at, at any moment. Um, but whatever it is, and I, and I want to I want to come back to like how one figures out that balance or how do we experiment around that balance. Yeah. But I think what you said is crucially important that as more senior people on the team, as leaders on the team, one of our jobs is to acknowledge the difficulty of finding that balance and to be there for the people underneath and around us uh, and parallel to us. Um, you know, I I just like you said, I can I can list in exquisite detail, the exact cases where the first couple of things happened, the first patient that I lost, the first time I did CPR and broke somebody's ribs, you know, all of those moments are just like burned into you. Um, I, I, I remember uh, in Mass General, it was room 12, uh, and I was a third year resident and I missed a central line and it, I just kicking myself left, right and center about it. And one of my attendings, Toby Nagurney, who's an incredible doctor, uh, came over to me and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he, and he, he goes, Dworkis, I've missed more lines than you've ever been thought about making. Yeah. It happens to all of us. Let's yeah. get back into it. And and that moment of like watching this person that I respected so yeah. much just say, hey, I, you know what? 
we are imperfect and we practice imperfectly and that's okay. Yeah. And the question is, how do you keep moving? Um, so if you're listening to this and you are a trainee, please know that we all make mistakes. Yes. If you're listening to this and you are an attending and you're a leader and you have a team underneath you, please reach out to the people and let them know that nobody's perfect, that this is part of it. The opposite of that is also very, very important. We often we often focus on our failures, right? Mm -hmm. We often focus on what can what else can we do better because we are, in, in by definition, uh, we're very resilient people. So we're always trying to be um, uh, be better and forcing ourselves, and so like that's why the concept of of doctors need to be more resilient is very tough. And and this just got published a couple of weeks ago. That's yes, indeed, uh, not a big surprise. Physicians are already resilient. However, I think we also miss the point sometimes when we truly have a successful um, save. Uh, we do a lot of high fives and we do the the. Um, hurrah and, and and celebration, but we don't really debrief that. We don't pause and really take a moment. It's more of, oh my God, that was a great save. That was a tough airway. Move on. We see the next patient. What I'm trying to do now, um, and and I think that this is something that everybody can, can kind of uh, practice as well and ask yourself if you're doing this as well. When you save somebody or, or if a resident like does a great resuscitation, I pull them aside like and, and say, hey, this is what it feels like to save a life because then they can reflect on that feeling. You really are mindful of that exact moment because we etch so many of our memories on the mistakes that we've done over the years. And that adds to residue. What Hopefully what, the, what this will do is to kind of counter that with memories, great memories of this is how it feels to do something amazing. This is how it feels to do something great. And, and every time I've done that, the residents have this look like, yeah, that's right. But we don't take a moment to do that. It's more of like, hey, great job on that. And then we move on. And so they don't really remember that, hey, great job on that. They just, it's just one of the, it's part of our job. We are very, we are very used to a, um, in an environment where nobody really sends us thank you letters, right? So the very few times that we get a thank you letter, I save those. Um, and yet, see, I, I see you're smiling because it's true. We rarely get thank you letters. The, the people that get thank you letters are the internists upstairs because they take care of them a lot longer. It's the surgeons that does the does the appy. It's not the ones who diagnose in an emergency department. And so when we do really, really cool things, um, I, I think it's something that we also should try to acknowledge and pause and say, hey, what you're feeling right now? All of this, I want you to just pause and, and remember this. Like your heart is racing as well. You're really elated. Like this is how it feels like to do something really, really awesome. Have you ever read um, uh, Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke? Yeah, Annie Duke, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the way that she talks about um, in her book, Thinking in Bets, this idea of, of fielding, right? Which is to take an event that happens and to decompose what happened into your performance, the part under your control versus the outcome, which is essentially what happened to the part outside of your control. Um, and to build that matrix and to run through it, I think is a really important skill that of, in terms both of self-reflection and the ability to understand what one can learn from a case, where the signal is in, in the result of a case. Um, and I think that that's important, like you said, to do not just for cases with bad outcomes, but also to do for cases with good outcomes, because you need to understand, you need to create that feedback reinforcement loop when you're doing something correct. And this also gets back to peak, which we talked about earlier, right? Which is how do you create a deliberate practice system? Practice, yeah. Right. And the way to get better at something, you need to you need to understand what you did, what happened and the link between those two. And to me, that's one of the hardest things about practicing emergency medicine is being able to, to make sure you actually understand the link between what you did and what happened. Yeah, um, that's a very, very good point. I think the biggest challenge there is um, it, and they highlighted it in the book Peak. You need a coach for this. You need somebody who act, you you need a a clear path of success. You need to know what success looks like. And unfortunately, emergency medicine we don't know that, right? We only know we we're very it's it's very rare for us to to have a clear certainty for everything that we do. We just know that we try something and there was not not a bad outcome, and then we were able to dispo them, um, or we do a procedure and we were able to successfully do it. Um, but we don't really know until three, five days later what happens to that patient. Or unless we, even if, if we don't follow up on those patients, 
we may not even know that we were right. In our minds, we thought that we were right, but if we actually do look up like uh, what happened in the the course of care of this patient uh, during the inpatient uh, uh, service, or if you call them at home, like especially the, the patients with abdominal pains, you may not re realize that they're actually getting worse unless you come back to those shift again and you get that um, colleague is like, hey, remember that guy? And, and you're like, ah. you have that like, intense knot in your in your uh, abdomen as well of like okay tell me like what what did i screw up and so my, my point here is think is that we, we don't really follow as well uh follow our patients as much which i think it's a missed opportunity and at the same time i think we ourselves as faculty we may not be as confident to say that this is exact what we're doing is a hundred percent because we're never really a hundred percent in our in our management well i think most of the time most of the time it 100% is not within the realm of emergency medicine no. most of the time. And, and in part, that's because as humanity, we haven't invented medicine that's 100% good at basically anything. Yeah. Um, but it's but the interesting. But practice requires you to have like 100%. Like, so when you do the mastery learning checklist, you have to have a 100% what we're doing, all of the things that they ask you to do. Um, and if not, you fail, you start over again. You do it over and over again until you get it right. Um, you can't really do that for many of the things that we do in emergency medicine unless you break it down into tiny steps and then you can focus on those. And most most of us, we're not trained to think that way. We, yeah. we create mental models and, and representations that um, we, I just know that this patient comes in and like huffing and puffing with their breathing and then they're like their habitus or, or whatever else that comes, uh, uh, they have a dialysis port. I'm going to be like, okay, this is a flash pulmonary edema. And so you already have a plan in mind before you even like, walk into the room. We have all of this, but like from a junior learner, that's kind of hard. And and those ones are easier, I think, to impart to to a, a junior learner. But when it's a vague patient that's presenting, especially during the COVID uh, pandemic, most of us are, are are not really sure that this patient do not have COVID. We just make a lot of assumptions based on our previous uh, practice. Okay, I want to try to contextualize a, a little bit of this again, and. And, sure. and again, I think we're on the track of how do how do we personally become better at performing in emergencies and how do we build teams that become better in emergencies? And, and there's a belief in there that in order to get better over time, we need to understand what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, or what we could be doing better, and then to tune ourselves. There's this self-tuning component of it. Yes. When we're in a residency, uh, when we're in direct training, we have that coaching and we're better able to sort of have somebody else help us tune but most of our careers are spent outside of that outside of that bubble essentially the vast majority if we're lucky about it and we and we get to live long um you know and so we're on our own most of the time trying to learn how to perform under pressure and i think that that if you're not an er doctor and you're listening to this you're probably also in the same the same boat sometimes you have coaching but a lot of the times you don't and it's up to you to help figure out this whole self-tuning thing and and in order to figure that out, we have to go back to this idea that you said, which I really want to push on, which is what does success look like? What does it actually look like? How do we know if we're doing something well or not? And you you got at something which um, Felix Enkel and I were talking about in this last episode that came out, which is the idea of what you, within the context of an unpredictable or difficult yeah. to predict event like a code, what are small things that you can predict? Right? How can you break down this vast concept of what you're supposed to do into smaller pieces? And then those pieces are sometimes easier to define. What is success? Are we doing well? Are we succeeding at this thing? Even if we're not able to actually necessarily answer that for the whole picture. So I, I, guess, I'd, I guess I'd hypothesize or put out there that one answer in terms of defining what success is, is to break down large things into small things, which are easier to understand and find success at those things. It's a bit reductionist, and I, I think it, it loses some things, but it's it's a place to start. What else? What else do you think defines success? How do you know if you're doing a good job on a case? I think uh, that's a tough question. Um, right? It's a surprisingly tough question. I, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, man, I got I to gotta dig on that. For me, I think often, um, if I'm being truly honest, it's very hard to define success. Um, and so I go for um, those secondary measures, which is, is my patient comfortable? Is my patient, um, do they feel that we actually took care of them? Or do they feel that 
there's just a bunch of random people in multiple suits going in and out, doing a bunch of tests, and they have no idea what we just did, but that they're fine, right? That's how I measure my success. If, if I was able to connect to a patient and, and, and they actually will truly remember that encounter uh, because they're scared. Uh, often, a lot of these conversations that we're having now is focused on us, which is very, very important. Um, I, there, there's a concept called um, relationship-centered care, uh, which is not the same as patient-centered care, because I think that creates this divide that's, okay, we have to do everything for the patient. That, that's why we burn out. That's why we get all of these um, disconnects feelings uh, with, well, I'm the doctor. I need to tell you this. So the opposite is also not true. It's not good, like the doctor-centered care, because we have to include the patient in, in the decision-making. The relationship-centered care really truly involves the patient and you and your relationship with them. And so for me, I think what is important in, in defining success, uh, in one end, is the perception from the patient experience. Um, that's the quality piece from, from the patient encounter perspective. Did they feel that I listened to them? Did they feel that I valued them as a person? Um, and did I feel like that I connected with them? So that's one success. Because I may fail, I may miss a diagnosis, but in the end, they'll know that I that I truly tried, mm -hmm. right? And that is what we can offer in emergency medicine. We will not be 100% sure for everything that we tell them, but if I can at least get them to feel that we are working together to, to figure out what's going on, I think that's success. Um, from a resuscitation perspective, did the patient die? I think it's an easy um, um, measure of success. Although I would argue that one of my like most important conversations are actually dying care, uh, because I think that that's actually sometimes like um, number one, it's 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 what the patient wants or what's the what what the family um, have accepted to have happened, and and walking them through the process of death. I think it's also a very, very powerful connection. So for me, those are, when I get those patients, I actually love to have that encounter because it validates my role as a doctor. I'm not just like somebody who's like pushing an admission or doing a CT scan to diagnose something. Um, however, the majority of our work is really um, convincing people that they're okay, right? And for the, those small portions of resuscitation, the success, another way to look at it when you said, how do we measure how teams are better, um, is how we communicate. You can have the most successful resuscitation, great outcome, thoracotomy, patient went to the OR, survived, got discharged. But if that encounter with the nursing staff, with the respiratory therapist, the pharmacist in the room, they remember how brutal that was, I've lost that game, right? I've lost that, and, and, and it is not a success. Um, and so I, I love what uh, Felix and you have talked about, which is breaking it down into pieces, which means that in every single event, you can have a lot of positive, a lot of wins, and also a lot of failures if you're truly going to be critical about it. Um, and you're right, it's reductionist. But then you just figure out, you you set the, the, the expectation ahead of time on what you want to look at um, as a success. I think that there is a real danger in making the success or failure whether or not the patient lived or died. Yeah. Because truthfully, that is beyond my control and our control a lot of the time. Um, you know, but it doesn't feel like that. It, it doesn't. But I think it's important to start working towards that, to understanding ah, yeah. that like, I'm not omnipotent. I am an imperfect human. I practice an imperfect science and I practice it imperfectly. And yeah. my job is not to keep everybody alive because if that was my if that was my gold standard, I would never live up to myself and I agree. and I would burn out so much quicker. So so if that's not our measure of success, now certainly I want my patients to live, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. But what else is there that's measures of success? And so it, was it a good resuscitation, right? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, part of it, you can feel. You can feel yeah. the energy in the room. Was there cohesion? Did we compile a shared mental model that makes sense, communicate it effectively, execute it well, and do our jobs? Did we design a plan that was elegant, worthwhile, and executed well? And, you know, I'm, I'm spitballing this a little bit, and I think it's yeah. maybe worth sitting down and defining some of sure. these concepts a little bit better. Um, but I think that that is not just life or death that even in a case where 
ultimately you're unable to save the patient and they do die, you can still have a successful resuscitation in the sense that your team did well yeah. and you did your job well and you learned and you got better for the next patient. Um, I go back a lot to this idea of never wasting suffering. And I think that that's one of my metrics of success is did whatever suffering happened, did I learn something from it? Did I try to transmute it into something better for either me, my residents, my team, or for yeah. the next patient that walks in? Right. And I think that's, that's where, you know, when there are really bad outcomes, that's what I personally rely on to get me up the next morning, right. Is knowing that, okay, I'm not going to waste that suffering then if that happened. Yeah. I, I'm reminded of a quote from Patch Adams. Um, in, in the movie, uh, he talks about if you treat a disease, uh, you win, you lose. If you treat a patient, I guarantee you, you'll always win. And, and, and I remember that, at least that when, when I've had bad outcomes, I can at least remember how I treated the patients. I am not perfect. So there are times that that's if, if we, are, we don't acknowledge our own emotions and how we, we manage uh, how hyperactivated we are or uh, if we don't know how to auto-regulate ourselves or at least just be aware of our emotions, um, we're human beings. Sometimes we respond uh, to, to our patients or our staff in a way that we would regret later on. Like, I wish I had done better. Um, but knowing what I know now and knowing about the concept of self-compassion, that's when that self-compassion truly matters. Um, you talk about uh, self-reflection self and, and how do we regulate ourselves. I think the most important part is to accept our common humanity, right? To be able to say that, you know what? There is a lot of suffering. There is commonality to there to these like mistakes that happen to medical harm. Some people even um, the, the the word uh, medical error is stigmatizing, uh, and so some people so um, uh, some people would use the word medical harm because it takes away blaming somebody and, and, and focusing on on what just happened. Uh, and the, I think for me the the, the idea of self compassion is it allows me to then realize like okay I'm blaming myself again. Um, I need to accept that, like you said, I'm not omnipotent. I, I, I have, I've done my best. And what else can I learn from that? Unless we're able to truly um, be kind to ourselves and, and really focus on that aspect that we're not alone in this experience, we will focus on the ruminations of the shoulda, coulda, woulda, I'm not good enough. Um, and the learning is not going to be perfect in that environment. You're never actually going to learn as much uh, because either you're going to blame other um, other systems or other other people, or you're going to blame yourself. And 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 I think that's how people truly lead to burnout. So what do you envision as the opposite of that? Like if you could build a and clearly you're doing this as your your part of your current job right now. But if you yeah. could build a training program both for junior learners and then for folks like us who are outside of the residency universe. If you could build a training program that that enabled people to maximize the balance of the correct tension, to have self-reflection in a way which was supportive and um, growth-oriented as opposed to harmful, how would you do that? What would that involve? I think it involves a lot of reflection, deliberate re reflection. So debriefs after events, some people call it the after action review. And so for every resuscitation, good or bad, however the outcome is, um, as we are trying to define it earlier, we talk about it. What went well? Um, did we give people voice in that room that was part of the team? Or was it just like run by one person and everybody actually in their minds were disagreeing? I think those are times for me uh, when I've done this uh, with, especially during COVID, um, when there was a moment when there was a decrease in our volume, I tried to really do a debrief at least once a shift for whatever uh, resuscitation we did, even if it's a minor one, only to focus on the communication as aspect of it. Because once we start talking about the communication, there's for me, there's several wins here it creates a psychological safety that we're now this is just part whenever I work, they know that it's like, I'm going to do some sort of debrief in one of the cases. And so it doesn't create that big of a sting when I say like, Hey, when I asked for that blood pressure cuff and you kept on like putting in on you, you're putting in that, the, uh, uh, raising the bed of the patients. Um, it's a mismatch for what we needed to happen versus what was happening. Um, 
And also I can get feedback from them. Yeah, when you kept on saying that, it was actually very annoying because what you didn't see from my perspective was that there's the ammo bag that's stuck um, with that bed and I, I needed to raise that bed. Like, see, so we, a lot of these, I think is if we don't, so self-reflection is great, but it's limited because it's limited with my perspective only. But once we debrief, it allows us to open up the conversation. Um, and if it's a safe space and you actually create that, um, people are willing to teach each other, to learn each other, and we're kinder to each other. And because we realize that we're also humans, right? We realize that, oh, I ask five different medications all at once, and that nurse cannot possibly do all of that all at once. And so a lot of these empathy that happens, you you recognize that once you're actually talking about it and you're hearing different people's perspective. Hmm. So I think that's how I would drive if if... If I have control of everything in, in, in a residency program and I want a system that's going to be geared for learning, I think we have to find more time to debrief. And, and unfortunately, the system is not set up like that. Our volume is so high. And so, but, but that is very critical, I think, from an early learner for interns. Because right now, what they are trying to learn, aside from finding the bathroom and reading Rosens and Tintinale, is to not screw up to know how to suture, to know all these like procedures and also to impress us because all their lives so far, they've been graded and they think that if they don't suture it the right way or if they miss that uh, central line that they've failed. And all of a sudden, what they don't realize is once you get into residency, failure is very different. Like right now, we had to pause and actually be deliberate about defining success and failure. But for them, it's grades. And they don't realize that they're not being graded anymore. And so when we give them feedback to bring back to that con uh, conversation earlier, they think that they failed. And we need to get rid of that. And I think to, to, in order to, to get rid of that, we have to just immerse them into a heavy feedback environment um, that takes away the stigma of, okay, I screwed up. One thing we said, which I think is really important to reiterate, which is which is about this idea of understanding success and failure again, is that the better we're able to define and collectively share a model of what success looks like, the better we're able to train ourselves to get there. And so I think that collectively as a team, we need to spend time understanding what it means to succeed at a resuscitation or whatever it is that we're doing. Um, that leads us into being able to debrief because debriefing and and asking ourselves, did we succeed and how did we succeed? Yeah. Did we fail? How did we fail? What are we going to do differently? This after action report or a SWOT analysis or whatever yes. you want to do. Yeah. Um, you know, that's predicated on knowing what success looks like, one. And and two, it's predicated on, a, on an environment and a culture which values continual improvement, which doesn't believe that we're cooked, which doesn't believe that we're totally done, but which instead says we're all in this together and we're all learning. Um, you, you know, I think it's been a, a real joy of mine lately in the last year, although pre, pre-COVID sentence here, uh, to go back to learning jujitsu and really starting over as a white belt in a lot of ways. And to, again, be in a space where learning and growth are the sh like total focus of what you're spending your time doing. Um, and trying to incorporate that mindset, that beginner's mindset into emergency medicine and to value that learning and growth and to make it clear that we're all learning together as we go forward with this. And that's, I think, part of what you're saying with the idea of, of a feedback heavy environment, because it's not unidirectional feedback. It's not, I know the answer and I'm giving you the answer. Yes. Right. It is collectively, we are trying to get better as a team and we need that feedback loop in order to do it. An important aspect of this as well is that when we feel that we made a mistake, it's very isolating. And I think the concept of developing this debrief session is that it normalizes not only the mistake, but it normalizes how isolating medicine can be, and it creates connection. Um, the more debriefs that I've done now, the more I feel connected with people. In part, the reason why I started doing more debriefs is because I felt so isolated with the masks and the gowns and everybody that I see now with COVID is just a bunch of masks and everybody is so worried about uh, PPE rightfully because we have to, right? And yet the human factor of this, we forgot that we're very gregarious people. We, we, we communicate and, and connect with each other and we want that sense of belonging. And we're literally restricting ourselves with that because of the social distancing that, that's happening. And debriefing allows us to connect. 
because there's vulnerability and we need that. I think that's the, the important ingredient for, um, for developing connection. It's interesting to me that we've discussed debriefing in a couple of ways here, and and I think that there's actually a couple of different threads about debriefing that focus on different things, right? Yeah. So there's the skill debriefing, like, okay, what was the issue when we attempted to get pressers into this patient? There was challenges with access, there was challenges with mixing the pressers, how do we design a system that better enables quick pressures to a, a sick patient. That's like a skill level thing. There's some of the emotional debriefing, which is what you're describing, which was I felt like this and I was worried and yeah. I needed to understand better that I was supported or I felt brave and I felt great about what I did. And that's a supported action. Like, like good, you shared that bravery with the room. There's but it's a, also understanding the frame. It's not just the emotions, it's their frame as well, because they might be in their mind, they're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing but there's just the wrong frame because they don't have the mental model yet to to understand the true what was happening at least from our perspective. Yeah, so I think that's why what the debriefing is also not just about. You're right. So the the mechanics of it, uh, but there's also beyond the emotions. It's their frame that I don't understand. And sometimes residents are very annoyed with this when I ask so much, so much, and, and they don't know me yet because I ask a lot of questions to actually understand why they did something, not to grill them and to make them feel bad. But to really understand, to put myself, to develop that empathy on, okay, so you decided to push Epi. Tell me more about that, because that's not probably something that I would have done, um, but I'm very curious. I think the question that you're asking is, is how do you debrief the mental models component of a resuscitation? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you collectively explore our understanding of what happened and how we can get better at that. It's so much less tangible than I couldn't get the wire into the central line because right. I didn't lower the angle appropriately in step three, right? Part of it is is you have to have the vocabulary, you have to have the ability to talk about mental models, you have to make this part of, part of what you guys dig into. Um, and maybe you have to ask some open-ended questions like what you did, which is what were you thinking when, when that decision happened? Like, what was your state of mind? But I'm not I even sure I really about, know how to do my learning. So that's very hard, actually. Say, um, sorry, I say that again. Yeah, sorry. So I learned it here in the in the West Coast. Uh, in, in New York, when I trained in the Bronx, it was a very different thing. Like, there there will be some words said. And I said, why, why did you do that, essentially? To now, I, I can't say that in, in California. I have to actually change my language to uh, otherwise it's, it's not going to be received well. And so so now I've learned to say, hey, I noticed this. What were you thinking? But more of, can you explain uh, your thought process? Uh, so I think there's, there's that component to it. Sorry I interrupted you. No, no. I, how do you ask those questions? What What is the way, how do you query somebody else's mental model how do you ask them to retrospectively go back and identify what they were thinking, bring it up to the group, share it enough in an after action report that you can dissect it and sort of understand how to put it through that feedback loop? This is the hardest part because it requires true psychological safety for them to open up to that and admit that they make a mistake. So um, often, especially at the beginning now, especially if there's new people in the in the debrief. So I, I'm a nocturnist. So the beauty with that is I know pretty much the people that I work with to a point, like it's very consistent as opposed to, I think day shifts have a lot more changes in the in the staffing. So at nighttime, if, if I know, if I'm doing a debrief and it's the same people that I've done debriefs, I don't have to really explain to them my, my feelings a lot because they understand me. But if there's somebody new, I make it a point to be the first one to share a mistake. I, 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 I again, that vulnerability uh, piece, I would tell them like, hey, that, that case, I was actually very nervous. It may not sound like it, but if you focus on the, my voice, it would shake a little bit. If you were looking at my fingers, it would shake a little bit. So I would own up to a lot of these things that does not make a, a doctor look good. Uh, because if they see that, that I'm comfortable sharing with them that I make a mistake and make mistakes as well, um, what I'm, what I see a lot more commonly is that then the nurses, the the residents feel a lot more comfortable sharing like, oh yeah, I own that part. I, I was not paying attention because I was so focused on this. Or yes, I yes, I, I I totally screwed up on that one. But it's very hard to to start people to own up to their mistakes if you yourself, especially if there's a hierarchy, if you cannot own own that up. 
you certainly have to set the tone as a leader to say that we believe this is important. We're going to talk about it. And also, this is what happened. Because I think what you said about it doesn't make you look good as a doctor is an incredibly telling statement, right? There's this vision of a doctor as a totally polished component yeah. that is like, you know, walks into a, a whatever room and just sort of like, does the thing and sinks the line from across the room and then everything's done. But to me, my version of myself, if I imagine what I want to look like, is a person who is constantly experimenting and growing and getting better, right? 100%. Part of, part of that's built on on the models of what, you know, I've learned in the martial arts community about what are the best martial artists doing. They're constantly yeah. refining their technique. They're constantly experimenting and playing. There's this playful sense of self-experimentation that goes on among the best martial artists that I've had a chance to work with that unfortunately I think is sometimes missing in the medical community, right? Where we need to bring in that sense of experimentation and joy and sort of modification of ourself because I want that sentence you said to go away, right? I want what makes you look good as a doctor to be open and exploratory and to be improving your team as you go forward. Yeah, there's real ramifications for our mistakes. Mm -hmm. People can die. We can get sued. Mm -hmm. And so there's all of these things that we try to shelter, like to, to put up a sod that we got it together. Um, and so I understand why most people, definitely most of us, even I, will have that moments when I, when I like uh, Brene Brown talks about puffing up. Like we, we try to puff up sometimes to, to prove to everybody that we got it. Totally. Uh, and, and that's why I think we have to also share that, you know what? I was not really as confident when I was in that room or I really didn't know. And the, the first, I, I, just, I still remember, I have a clear vision of, of the nursing staff and, and my residents being in this conversation when I debriefed and I shared with them, like, I was shaking when I was putting this central line because I was so nervous about like this patient uh, that I'm going to get stuck again. And, and they were like, really? Because you did that. So like you were so confident. And I was like, yeah, but what they didn't realize was I, like it brought back memories of what, what I shared with you. I stuck myself with somebody with AIDS um, and and sharing that with them makes me more human. And it's it, it actually makes it more that, yes, emergency medicine is tough as a field. And at the same time, it's attainable that we can get better at it to the point that we can be confident enough to own, our, own up our mistakes. I think that's why it's it's very, very helpful for leaders to truly share that and 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 I'm I'm fortunate to be in a place where um, my medical director, my chair, owns up to wh whenever something happens, like oh yeah, I totally screwed that up, like in plain simple language like that. But I've also worked in places where you're not allowed to say that, right? There are places where you're told that you can't even like look a certain way because it it creates a, a, a an image of a doctor that's not respectable, and and I think that's very hard um, because. Each of us have our unique ways of, of portraying ourselves and also conducting ourselves. And, and maybe holding a patient's hand is actually one of the most important things that we can do without necessarily diagnosing the disease or like fixing their problem. LA, this has been in, incredible to dig into. And like right now, we're coming back for round two, some point in the near future to keep digging into this, because I think there's so much meat in this idea of like, you know, how do you build a system that creates the space for compassion, self-reflection, and the ability to discuss with teams, not just these, not just the physical components of what medicines we delivered, but the mental components and the emotional components of how we were thinking and feeling and optimizing ourselves in these situations. Um, I don't think that exists the way that it should, and I think it's something we need to really think louder about how to build. Um, but I don't think it starts with us. I don't think it, it really cannot start with us. By the time we get residents, they've already been um, designed to be the way they are. And there's a lot more unlearning. So unless we create a, a curriculum of unlearning, it's very hard. Because you know what? There's all of these expectations that we have to also reach to train them, to be a great doctor, to chart better, to be able to, uh, to meet compliance for all of these things and not screw up and dress up like a doctor. And if you're a woman, if you're underrepresented in medicine, another layer of, of expectations, right? And it's very hard because you know what? As just a human being to a human being, we are not perfect, but mistakes for each of those layers that we add to ourselves. And 
as a new person, like the imposter syndrome that happens in that to think that you maybe they made a mistake. It's a lot to take on. And so, yeah, of course, if you don't know how to handle your own uh, imposter syndrome, because everybody has that. But if you don't know how to handle that, you either puff up and prove to everybody, you act like you know what you're doing. And that's how people are mean to each other, right? That's how people belittle other people's ideas because they want to show dominance or the opposite. You cower into this person of, Maybe if I just keep quiet, they're not gonna notice that I'm here because the more they ask me, they know that they're gonna the more that they're gonna realize that I don't know enough. The beauty with emergency medicine is that we can start wherever at a, at an any shift, and you can train somebody from one point to another, and there's a like a very tangible thing that they get better, right? That's why I love emergency medicine. Um, I can start off with a medical student who has never seen EKGs before, and you can train them on what to look for, for STEMI or not STEMI. But at the end of the shift, they're going to be at least confident enough to, to recognize things. There's a lot of pattern recognitions that we train ourselves to be in. And yet, unfortunately, we didn't get here understanding that. We got here because we were tough on ourselves. We pushed ourselves so hard. And we were, we were very viciously not welcoming to any failures. And you mentioned, and I love what, what you said, like we have to make a lot of mistakes safely. And that's why I think simulation is great. We have to make a lot of mistakes in order to innovate, in order to grow, in order to be better. Otherwise, we're just going to only reach a point of expertise that people haven't like thought of for ourselves. We won't reach our full potential, actually, because we're limited to what other people think, what that success is. And so I think that's why we struggled with what does success look like? Because your success might be very different from what I would consider success. And that's hard to do deliberate practice. Designing a system that starts from early on in training to um, indoctrinate people not with the goal is grades and not with the yeah. goal is this, but the goal is self-reflection and improvement and growth, super important. However, because I can't go back in time and start over, I also want to figure out how to tune myself as we're doing this. And I think that we need to understand that that there's parts of this that we can and should take on for our, our own practice um, as we're leading teams, even even imperfectly, even with all of the baggage that we have coming into it. How do we redesign our own systems as we go? Uh, yeah. I think, again, I, I truly believe it starts with self-compassion. We have to be able to be kind to ourselves because the, the kinder we are to ourselves, the more that we accept that, that we cannot control everything, the more that we're going to be open-minded to see that, okay, well, that did not go well. Let's talk about it. Unless you're kind enough to accept that for yourself, you're not going to be able to listen to other people to tell you that you screwed up because in your mind, you screwed up, right? Versus actually thinking about it, that was a medical harm. Let's talk about it. Language here matters a lot. So in our department, I'm very proud that our, our medical director changed it from peer review to case review. A simple change in the language. It's not about the peer anymore. You get rid of the name, blame, shame aspect of it and focus on the system. So you're right. We have the ability to change this at like even when, when people get to us, like when the trainees get to our point. But it, it does take deliberate effort with the way that we talk about it, the way that we correct people on, on how they talk about errors or mistakes or harm, and the way that we address it, right? Do you make somebody feel bad and stand in front and defend the case? Or do you talk on the side uh, and, and really truly debrief and, and share like, this is how I screwed up, and then represent that person in front of everybody and, and, and discuss the case, focus on the case, not the person. Because that person already learned something, right? They learned a lot. They learned that they that they screwed up. They learned that that they're not good enough. And and all of these learning, it's not right. It's actually it prevents them from learning the true thing that oh, okay, like how can one smart physician miss a STEMI, right? We've been trained in medical school so many times, so we know exactly what it looks like. Because but but if you actually debrief that further you'll realize that you get five EKGs all at once while trying to answer a very important phone call and then an orthopedic surgeon or somebody else is screaming at you on the other line for not doing X, Y, Z. And that's why when they slip that other EKG, you miss that STEMI. And yet at the end of the day, I miss the STEMI and I will have to answer to that to somebody. 
and I will go home and I'm going to blame myself. I can't believe I screwed up. I can't believe I, I missed up. Uh, I missed that STEMI. And that's the residue that builds up. The residue of being yelled at on the phone by another consultant, the residue of multiple EKGs all at once, and the residue, the bigger residue of getting a letter that you screwed up and missed a STEMI. I love it, man. That's a lot to work on. Yeah, but I think this is why um, focusing on high-performance teams and truly understanding it um, and, and breaking it down to different pieces. Like I just talked to you, so, so that EKG analogy happens a lot actually across the country, right? But people focus only on one part of that, which is that doctor who misses STEMI. But if you focus, if you have multiple teams, the CleanOps people focusing on the systems, right? The well-being person focusing on how you handle like errors like this, like, like how do you take care of yourself? Like a coach, like a life coach. And then, and then you have conversations, like another person that handles communication. How do you then debrief this? I think that's how we change the system. I don't think that exists yet. Hmm. But I think that's the growth mindset there. The answer is yet. Like we're not there yet, but this is not unheard of. This is not something that we cannot create. I right. think we have the ability talking about it right now. There's a lot of ideas that's flowing, right? Absolutely. I think the challenge is how do you take that on, like to, to make it happen on your next shift? Right. So, so how do you? What's your, yeah. what's your challenge to people for their next, uh, for their yeah. next shift? ER doctors are not for their next, whatever, whatever session it is where they're working on this kind of stuff. Like, like what's a, what's a good way to start? I challenge every single one of you to do a debrief on your next shift, whether you had a resuscitation or not, just pick a case and just create an environment where you can talk about how things went. And you focus on the human factors of it, the communication aspect, right? And the true outcomes. You can do your metrics, uh, the door to, to needle time or the door to EKG time. Like those are things that are, is easy to actually check off. And have one learning point about um, how that felt, how that felt to communicate. And I know this is not popular. It'll take a lot of time, at the very least five minutes, right? And we don't have five minutes usually. But we're emergency physicians. We're actually very good at figuring out the most sickest patients and, and, and the amount of time we can slow down when we're resuscitating. And so five minutes is actually not a lot. And yet we don't even take the time to go on a bathroom break or, or eat uh, during our, our shift because in our minds, there's always constantly things that's being dropped on our plate. Mm -hmm. I think being mindful and taking moments to just reflect is something that we don't do as often. And so my challenge would be on your next shift, take a moment to debrief with someone about an experience. What you'll realize is that you're not alone in, in your thought process, or at least you may make somebody else feel that they're not alone when they felt that they screwed up. Because in your mind, it may not be a significant error, but from a trainee's perspective, they're gonna get fired. Right. Or they just got they just killed somebody or they just like miss a big diagnosis and, and they're going to be blamed for that. Right. That's how we normalize things, I think. I love it. L.A., thank you so much, man. This has been awesome ah, to talk to you about. Super, super cool. And uh, I'm already uh, already can't wait for round two. <laughs> I love it. Okay, folks, that brings us to the end of this conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found something useful that you can use next time you find yourself in an emergency or a crisis. Again, if you want to dig deeper into a lot of the concepts that we covered here, sign up for the Emergency Mind newsletter, Knowledge Under Pressure. It is free and it is awesome. You can join by going to www.emergencymind.com slash sign up. Also, as a reminder, our mission here at The Emergency Mind is to dig into lessons around applying knowledge under pressure, not to provide medical advice. Our opinions, as expressed on this podcast or elsewhere, are our own and not necessarily those of our employers or the hospitals at which we work. So keep up the good work, keep training, and good luck out there.